Well, thank you for watching this special video. Now, in this video, I like to think of it as kind of a set list of what I can offer you for lesson series if you would like to host me for a gospel meeting, revival, a seminar, or a lectureship. Oh, and if you wouldn't mind, hit that subscribe bar, and then uh, when the notification bell pops up, click on it so you can be notified anytime I add content to the channel. And like these videos, comment on these videos, share these videos, even this one. And uh, so let's go on with it and look at what I can offer your congregation by way of lessons that can be ones that'll be thought-provoking, they'll encourage the members, and there'll be ones that you can invite uh, your friends and neighbors to. There's nothing in any of these lessons that will embarrass you or embarrass the visitors that come, but some of them will present uh, thought-provoking issues, thought-provoking questions that uh, hopefully will get discussion going. Now, I've got several sets uh, that I can offer. I kind of think of it as a musician or a band that's on tour. They have a set list of what they're going to perform. I've got several set lists, if you will, of what I can present to your congregation or your school of preaching, your school of biblical studies, that uh, would be good for lectureships or whatever the occasion is. So uh, let's go in the auditorium now, and I will show you these set lists. If there's something that you think of that is not covered by any one of these uh, set lists, then let me know about it. I'll be glad to tailor a uh, lesson series for your congregation, for your occasion, so that uh, it will get the best benefit. So don't go anywhere. Let's go in the auditorium right now, and I will show you uh, what I can do for you. All right, we'll be right back. So let's have a look at these set lists that I have prepared and these lessons. And I'll give you the title of the set and a brief summation of the lessons and the content of each one. And this is, remember, to help you. This is about your congregation, about your college, your lectureship so that it can get the maximum effectiveness for the members or for visitors or whoever your target audience is. We can do this as an old-fashioned revival. That's what the Baptists and the Assemblies of God and folks uh, like that would call it. We called it a gospel meeting. Essentially the same thing. And I realize these have fallen on hard times in the last several years. But I really think that if we Christians would get excited about hearing and about proclaiming the gospel, I think we could get our neighbors excited. I mean, let's think about it. Hey, what are you doing Sunday? Oh, I got to go to church. Got to go to church? How about I get to assemble with God's people to hear the gospel proclaimed, to hear a lesson from God's word. I get to go into the presence of the creator of the universe, and I get to be with his people, my people, my family, my, my spiritual church family. And it's great, because wherever I go in the world, there are Christians that I can gather with. All right, wouldn't you like to do that, too? Why don't you come with me, and we can study the Bible, and we can talk about it, and you can ask questions, because we do welcome questions. And we want people who are searching. Now, if you've got a lectureship, maybe you're aiming more for members to be edified, or to be taught, or uh, preaching students, or college students, you know, I can help you with that, too. And then there are the church seminars. Now, my experience with these is if they call it a seminar, it's usually got something to do with apologetics or evidences, or it's something about the family. But whichever uh, title you like to give it, whichever designation you like, uh, that's fine. Just uh, let me know. Now, I have a number of formats that I can do this in. Now, when I became a Christian back in 19... It's none of your business, don't worry about it. But back in those days, we were still doing the Sunday to Friday gospel meetings. And then they were shortening some to Sunday to Thursday. And now Sunday to Wednesday seems to be, if people are still doing gospel meetings and seminars and, and revivals, Sunday to Wednesday, even among the denominational churches, seems to be the, the uh, going uh, format. We can also do a one-day series. I'll do up to four series. If you want to say do a Saturday series, I can do as many as four series, four lessons, or uh, four on a Sunday, of uh, Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday morning preaching, an after lunch session, and then maybe a late afternoon or an evening session. And then we've got weekend series. I've done a couple of these. I can do, a, a, say, a Friday night session of one or two uh, lessons, and then uh, up to four on Saturday. Uh, we can even do uh, two or three sessions on Sunday. 
And if you want to have a Q&A session, we can substitute one of these sessions. For instance, we could take that Friday night, do one lesson, and then do a Q&A. Or do uh, three sessions on Saturday with lessons, and then do a Q&A somewhere in there. Uh, whichever one you would like. Remember, this is your meeting. This is your lectureship. I'm just a facilitator. I'm just a help. Now, here's the set lists, and there's several of them. And if, as I said earlier, if you think of something that's not covered in one of these sets, let me know, and I can prepare lessons dealing with that. God, Grace, and You. This was uh, my uh, second book published by 21st Century Christian. It came out in, are you ready for this? January 2020, right as the pandemic hit. Uh, so you mightn't have missed it in all the excitement that happened then, but this is just what it says. It, it's a book about grace. It's not a traditional proof text uh, about it. Uh, if you look at my introduction video to the channel, you can see a uh, review that was done on the book and how it is just a simple study of grace with lots of examples and things in it that uh, can help have a better understanding. Now, some of the topics included, and I've done a seminar uh, on this book, and instead of coming out and just reading the book to you, I typically augment the lessons that are in here. There's 13 chapters, and so I would come out and add something to it, or even prepare completely new lessons that cover the topics. Here's what I'm talking about. We'll look at what is grace. Let's define our terms and get the proper definition. Talk about how grace, faith, and action, our works, all come together for salvation and help us live a Christian life. And then, grace in times of trouble. I like to call it the foolishness of the prosperity gospel and how some people believe if I become a Christian, all of my problems go away. Well, if you've been a Christian more than about five minutes, you know that's not true, so we'll look at that. Transforming grace. How does grace work as far as our transformation and our growth as Christians? And then misconceptions about God's grace. You know, before I became a Christian, because I didn't grow up in a church going home, I had a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions about what Christianity is. And some people have the same misconceptions about grace. So we'll talk about those. And that God, this might be of interest to you. I got this line from a historical figure uh, who wrote uh, in the margins of some of his papers. I'm not going to tell you who the historical figure is. If you want to know that, you're either going to have to read the book or invite me to come out and present the lessons to you. And then, grace is for sinners, and we are all sinners. Romans chapter 3 tells us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5 says that while we were still enemies, God sent Jesus to pay the price for our sins. All have sinned. And there's a lot of people out there calling themselves progressive Christians who really don't believe in the concept of sin. They don't believe in the concept of hell. But the Bible says that we are sinners and there is a hell we're going to if we don't have the blood of Christ covering our sins. So that lesson would cover that. And then there's other options available in this particular series as well. Oh, to be like thee comes from the hymn. Oh, to be like thee, blessed redeemer. Uh, I'm not going to do a solo because, well, the Geneva Conventions and the UN Outlaw Torture, so we won't do a solo. But Oh to Be Like Thee, and this is actually based on a lesson series that I acquired years ago from somewhere, and some of the topics here are forgiveness. You know, we live in a very polarized, angry world. Forgiveness is definitely needed, and we'll look at the biblical definition of forgiveness and loving the unlovable. You know, people were really amazed that Jesus could love people that they didn't like, but yet, he told us we need to. And then, along the same lines, this man receives sinners. Oh, he's eating with sinners. He's eating with people uh, who don't think like us, who aren't part of us. Well, you know what? How else are we going to win people to the Lord if we don't eat with sinners, if we don't love the unlovable? And then telling others. Telling others about Jesus. Taking the good news to them. And overcoming hatred. Oh, here's a big one that we have to deal with today. And Jesus expects us to. He expects us to overcome our hatred, love the unlovable, and be with sinners, which leads us to brotherly love. We need it for everybody, even those who maybe have left the faith and are having hard times. We really need to show them what brotherly love is, and that's what this, this uh, lesson series is going to do for us.
All roads lead to heaven. Saw a post on Facebook a few years back where the, uh, the person said, there are 7 billion people on this planet. There are 7 billion ways to get to God. Well, she overstated that by 6 billion, 999 million, whatever the number is. Do all roads really lead to heaven? Let me give you the subtitle to this series. All roads lead to heaven, an other popular fiction. This is uh, things that people in the religious world believe, and maybe some of uh, the people sitting in our church buildings believe some of these things. Some of them might, I'm saying, okay, not saying definitely, but some might. For instance, some might believe that I'm sincere, so I must be right. Subtitle this one, Unto what then were you baptized? And looking at how we can be as sincere as we want to be, but it doesn't make you right. Just follow your conscience, we're told. Well, I can go down a list, of, and I mention a list of people in this uh, lesson who did follow their conscience and got them into trouble, or people whose conscience were seared that they could sin and do all kinds of evil, and it didn't bother them. And then, one church is just as good as another. After all, we're all on different paths going to the same uh, place, so all churches teach the same thing. It uh, doesn't matter what religion you are. We're all going to go to the same place. Okay, we're going to deal with that in this lesson and about whether or not there is uh, Christians in all denominations. Are all denominations Christian? We're going to look Christian. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in this lesson. I'm saved. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a teaser here. I had to study my way out of this belief. And a lot of people just believe, hey, I prayed a prayer, so I'm saved. Well, we're going to look at that and see what the Bible actually says about the idea of the sinner's prayer. And then the thief on the cross proves baptism is not essential to salvation. Really? Well, yeah, because Jesus said, uh, or, or the, the thief said, uh, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus didn't say, well, okay, get down off the cross and go to the creek over there and be baptized, and then you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus just said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. And yes, I believe the thief was saved, but what is baptism? How does that play into this question? And really, it's a very simple answer. But I'm finding a lot of Christians can't adequately answer it, and even people with PhDs and EDs and whatever alphabet soup after their name can't answer this question adequately from a biblical basis. That's what we'll do in this lesson series. And then, if all roads lead to heaven, did Jesus get it wrong? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, unless you believe that I am He, the Savior, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. John chapter 8 and verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. A direct reference to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. Okay, if I go to Pharaoh and say, uh, God said to let my people go, and he says, who is this God that I should obey? And what am I going to tell him? Thus you shall say to Pharaoh, I am has sent me to you. And Jesus said, ego me in Greek, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. They took up rocks to stone him. Why? Because he was claiming deity. So if Jesus was claiming deity and said he is the only way, but yet humans say you can get there any, to heaven any way you want, did Jesus get it wrong? That's what we'll look at in this particular lesson. And this particular lesson series gets some raised eyebrows and some surprised looks. Inaugural passages, it's got the presidential seal up there. What in the world does that have to do with the gospel? Glad you asked. Uh, as I make this video, Joe Biden's in the White House. We have 46 presidents, and about half of them had their Bibles open. Most of them did take the oath of office on a Bible. About half of them had the Bibles open, and we know what about half or maybe a few more of those passages were that they had their Bibles open to. Some of them were randomly opened. Some of them were deliberately uh, picked and opened to a particular passage. So in this series of lessons, I'll give you a little bit of presidential trivia, and then we go into a gospel sermon uh, on that particular passage. For instance, George Washington. His Bible was open to Genesis chapter 49. Martin Van Buren, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 10 to 20. 
Ike, uh, that would be Dwight Eisenhower, and Ronald Reagan both had 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Abraham Lincoln had uh, one of his Bibles open to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not lest you be judged. That's always a fun one to preach on. Andrew Johnson, the king's heart, out of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. And then Ulysses Grant, Proverbs 11, verses 1 through 10, pondering peace. And then, of course, there's many others in this lesson series. A conversion of some religious people. Now, we all have friends who say they believe in God. We have friends who attend church. We have friends who say they believe in God, they believe in Jesus. I even pray to Jesus. Uh, I go to church, you know, kind of when I can kind of thing. But are they saved? I've been going to the XYZ church every Sunday since I was born for the last 50 years, 60 years, 20, whatever it is. But are they really saved? Because you, It's like sincerity. You can be as religious as you want to be, but it doesn't mean that you're saved. And we look at some people in this lesson series who were very religious and very good people, but they weren't Christians. They weren't saved. Let's have a look at some of the lesson titles. Does it really matter what I believe? You know, a lot of people just say, hey, as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe. What does the Bible say? Do good, sincere people even need the gospel? Well, we'll, we'll look at that in that particular lesson. And then the conversion of the burnt-faced man. This is the Ethiopian eunuch that uh, Philip talked to in Acts chapter 8. We'll look at his conversion, as well as the revival in Samaria and the gospel going to a particular group of people that wasn't particularly well-liked. Confronting a misguided religious man. A lot of our friends are good people, but they are misguided as far as their beliefs about God and about the Bible, so we'll look at that. Cornelius, God-fearing man. Cornelius, your alms and your prayers have come up before God but you still need to send for Simon, uh, whose surname is Peter, and he will tell you what you must do, paraphrasing there. But Cornelius was a, was a good, generous man, but he still had to be taught the gospel. He still had to render obedience to it. And then, do I need to be baptized again? You see, sometimes people get baptized. Maybe they were baptized in the Lord's church. Maybe it was a denomination. Well, you know, I had water poured on me. Is that okay? Well, I had it sprinkled on me when I was six months old. I was baptized when I was five. I was immersed. Do I need to be baptized again because uh, I was baptized in the whatever church that I grew up in? Well, we'll have a look at that in this particular lesson. I got the title for this lesson from a comedian who said, I have a real moron thing I do. It's called thinking, because I like to form my own opinions. I don't just roll over when I'm told to. And so I kind of tweaked it. I already had the lesson series, and I was trying to think of a title. So I just took it, tweaked it a little bit, and here we go. Thinking, a real Christian thing to do. The world has this idea that as a Christian, you can't think critically. You can't believe in science. I hear people say, well, I would believe in religion, but I believe in science. Well, you know what? I believe in science, too. Real science and the Bible don't contradict each other. Now, the Bible, of course, is not a science book, and, and my point is not to do a science lecture here. But it is to make the point that you don't have to check your brain at the door when you go into the church building, which is the idea that a lot of people have of Christians. In fact, that is the first lesson in this series. Don't check your brain at the door. When you come in, bring your Bible. Whether you have a paper and ink copy or it's on your phone or on your tablet, bring your Bible and be ready to study, just like you would do if you were in school going to math class. You know, I was in a church one time, and I went through the directory, and everybody from about the age of 12 or 13 up, I went through and said, how many of these people bring their Bibles? I calculated that 62% of the members of that church, age 12 and up, did not bring a Bible with them, Sunday morning or Sunday night, if they came Sunday night, or on Wednesday night, if they came Wednesday night. Mentioned that a couple of times, and I had a lady tell me, you know what? It really bothers me that you're bothered by the fact we don't bring our Bibles. You know what? Would you be saying that about your child if the teacher called to say, hey, Fauntleroy isn't bringing his math book to math class? You know what, teacher? That bothers me that, that, that you're upset or bothered by my child not bringing his math book to math class. 
No, you'd probably be getting off the phone saying, come here, son, let me have a talk with you. If, if, if you want to learn the Bible, you got to bring the textbook, just like you need your textbook for math class. Bring it with you. And don't check your brain at the door, and do not be afraid to ask questions. It is okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask the tough questions. Sometimes we get a little uncomfortable. But here's the thing. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. A disciple is a student. What do students do? They ask questions. Think about that math class. The teacher comes in, here's the algebra lesson. Questions, anybody? Yes, what's your question? And they answer it. Same thing with history class, economics class, whatever your science class. And the teacher may ponder that and say, okay, that's an interesting question. Now let me ask you a question. Sort of like Jesus did. By what authority, Jesus, do you do these things? I'll answer your question, but first you answer my question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men? Uh, now, of course, that was kind of a gotcha. But Jesus, the master teacher, knew when to ask questions of his students. He knew what kind of examples to use. So don't be afraid. And if you are in a group where questions are not welcome, or they give you dirty looks, or they just like the canned questions that they know pat answers to, I'd say get out of there. Go find some place where you can ask honest, legitimate questions and have honest discussion. I don't mind questions uh, as long as we're having an honest discussion. And you also have to understand the answer, quite frankly, that I get maybe I don't know. Doesn't mean you're dumb. Doesn't mean you've lost the argument. Just means, hey, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I even had a doctor once tell me that. After going through several treatments of, of, a, of a minor issue it was, but it was still there, she just shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know. Well, I have to send you to a specialist. It's the way it goes sometimes. What's the Bible for? A lot of people don't even understand what the Bible is, or that it's broken into two parts. Sometimes I have to start with, this is a Bible. It's broken into two parts. And go from there, not being condescending, but hey, let's face it, people in this day and age, there's a lot of biblical illiteracy going on. Be a Berean. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? because they studied the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was uh, teaching them was correct. And remember, Paul was a divinely inspired apostle. If anybody didn't need to be checked, it was him. But they still checked. Okay, Paul, we hear what you're saying. We're going to see what the Bible says. Okay, yep, that looks good. Of course, they were looking at the Old Testament uh, uh, scriptures. So if they thought it important to double-check what Paul was telling them, an inspired apostle, how much more important is it for us today to be Bereans? Don't take my word for it because I'm the preacher or an elder's word for it or a deacon. Study it. Look at it for yourself. And again, what was that I said in that last lesson? Ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask questions. And then color her skeptical. This is a Bible character, who, and I'm not going to tell you who it is because you'll have to invite me to present the lessons. But she had a promise made, and she was very skeptical of it whether or not it could be fulfilled. Of course, God made the promise, so of course it was fulfilled, and like I said, that's all I'm going to say about that right now. Think about it. This is where we need to think about making an informed choice about becoming a Christian and making an informed choice about living the Christian life. Don't, again, don't just, why were you baptized? I don't know, that's what my church said. Or why do you believe X or Y? Well, that's what the preacher said. That's what my dad told me. You know, let's get a good, solid reason why we believe what we believe. And cross-reference your preacher. This kind of goes along the lines with be a Berean. Don't take the preacher's word for it, just because he's the preacher. Study it for yourself. So these are just some of the samples that I have, and there's some others that are on the, uh, on the uh, channel, if you want to take a look at, uh, at that. And if you see uh, something or think of something that you would like to have a lesson series on, uh, just shoot me an email, 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com, and I'll be glad to prepare a lesson or a series of lessons on whatever the topic is you would like. Remember, this is your gospel meeting. This is your revival. This is your lectureship, your seminar. I'm just a tool. I'm just here to help you facilitate it and reach the goals that you have so that your members will be strengthened and your neighbors will have an opportunity to hear solid, sound gospel preaching. Thanks for watching the video. Thank you for your time. 
That's it for this video. Don't forget to hit the subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it pops up. And then you'll be notified anytime I add content to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. Thanks for watching. That's it for this video. See you in the next video. I'm out.